Okay, so welcome to the uh, next installment of the Ring Vorlesung. So the whole lecture series is about nonlinear algebra, which is in a continuation of linear algebra. And one aspect of uh, nonlinear algebra is piecewise linear algebra. So you can think about tropical algebra as piecewise linear algebra. And later on, we're going to relate it to classical algebra. Let me start with a, a problem in classical algebra. So at the top, you see a polynomial in one variable x of degree 4. And we'd like to write the roots in terms of the coefficients. So the coefficients are powers of t. Think about t as a, a small parameter, small positive parameter. And we'd like to express x as a function of t. Now, if x were a quadratic polynomial, then there's a formula you learn in high school in Germany, in elementary school in Iran, and I don't know, middle school in Italy. And, uh, but with degree 4, it's a little more complicated, right? There's Cardano's formula. But you can always write down series solutions. So in this case, it's an equation of degree 4. It has four solutions. And the first one starts out, so I expand this in powers of t, so it starts out as minus t to the minus 4 plus higher powers of t. You can see this uh, Laurent series in t. Then x2 starts minus t to the minus 3 in higher powers. And then there are two more solutions whose coefficients require complex numbers. So a is a, a complex number. It's a primitive third root of unity. And uh, then, again, we start with a times t to the minus 1, something t, something t cubed, something t to the fourth, and so on. So these are the four roots of a polynomial of degree 4 in one variable written as series expansions. And we'll get back to this. This is, in fact, one of the exercises in today's exercise sheet. OK, so back to tropical algebra. So we're going to work in the tropical semi-ring. So where we take the real numbers together with an additional element plus infinity. And we have two operations, tropical addition and tropical multiplication. And they are defined in terms of the classical operations. So tropical addition, the sum of two tropical numbers, x and y, is the minimum of x and y. So 3 plus 5 would be 3. Um, infinity serves as the neutral element. So any number plus infinity in tropical arithmetic is that number, like 3 plus infinity makes 3. We also have multiplication. So multiplication is defined to be classical addition. So a 3 times 5 makes 8. So it takes a little bit of practice to getting used to this. The multiplicatively neutral element is 0. So uh, 0 times x is x in tropical arithmetic. So this is the tropical semi-ring with tropical addition and tropical multiplication. Now, elementary school students prefer tropical arithmetic to classical arithmetic because it's easier. Right? It's very hard to memorize the multiplication table but it's easier to memorize the tropical multiplication table. Um, let's practice a little bit more. Let's look at the uh, binomial theorem in tropical arithmetic. So I claim that for any two real numbers, x and y, if we look at x plus y tropically, and then we multiply this with itself three times tropically, so x plus y, of course, x plus y is 0x plus 0y, right? Because 0 is the multiplicatively neutral element. So we expand this, and we get 0x cubed. This is tropical. 0x squared y plus 0x um, y squared plus 0 times y cubed. And then for any two real numbers, the two middle terms can never win, right? So this minimum will always be attained either by the left term, if x is smaller than y, or by the right term. And then we can cancel the 0. So we get x cubed tropically times 
y cubed, okay? So this identity that x plus y cubed is equal to x cubed plus y cubed is sometimes called the freshman's dream in America, and it's true, of course, in characteristic three, but not otherwise. But in tropical geometry, that's always true. x plus y to some power is the tropical sum of those two powers. And Pascal's triangle is very simple, right? You form Pascal's triangle just like classically. You write the multiplicatively neutral element on the left side. You write the multiplicatively neutral element on the right side. And then any entry in Pascal's triangle is the sum of the two entries above. So you have a triangle filled with zeros. So that's uh, tropical arithmetic. Now we have linear algebra, so we have matrix, vector operations. <clears throat> so for example, if we have a two by two matrix with entries two, three, five, and 11, and we multiply it with the column vector four, zero, then we get a column vector, so two times four makes six, Three times zero makes three, you add them up, you get three. Five times four makes nine, 11 times zero makes 11, you add them up, you get nine. Okay, so that's the usual, Francesco, you look confused, that's the usual vector matrix multiplication. Let's look at a rank one matrix, so rank one matrix is the product of a column vector times a row vector, so for example, we can make a two by three, rank one matrix by multiplying a column vector such as three nine by a row vector such as seven minus one two. So this makes a two by three matrix and by definition that's a rank one matrix. So, uh, so here each entry is just the product. So three times seven makes 10, three times minus one makes two, three times two makes five. And then uh, the second row is obtained by the, from the first row by multiplying by six. So you just multiply the first row by six, you get 16, eight, and 11. A two by three matrix of tropical rank one. Now, tropical arithmetic comes up in, uh, in many contexts. So for example, uh, these matrix vector operations are useful for dealing with the discrete math problems like shortest path problems. So shortest paths in a directed graph, weighted directed graph. So uh, let's say I have a directed graph G and the edges have lengths. So the edge lengths are uh, D, I, J, non-negative edge lengths. So the, I have a directed graph and the edge from node I to node J has a non-negative weight D, I, J. Think about the uh, flight network of an airline and D, I, J might be the cost of a ticket or the distance or the time traveled, right? So from city I to city J, if there's a non-stop flight, then D, I, J, is the cost of that ticket. Now, it's still the case that you don't pay if you don't travel, so DII is zero. And furthermore, if there's a no non-stop flight, so if DIJ would be plus infinity, if there's no edge, no directed edge from city I to city J. So, so that's accounted for in our tropical semi-ring. We put plus infinity if there's no way to fly directly from city I to city J. Now we, of course, have the adjacency matrix. So the adjacency matrix is simply the matrix with the entries D, I, J, and that is in general not a symmetric matrix. It might be that the price for flying from I to J is different for flying from J to I. So then we have the following easy proposition. <clears throat> so proposition, the entry in row I 
and column J in the adjacency matrix. So that's an N by N matrix. <clears throat> of the n by n adjacency matrix dg and then we multiply this to the power n minus 1. So I have the entry, the matrix dg and I take dg times dg times dg tropically n minus 1 times where n is the, uh, the number of cities. So just to be very clear, so this is dg times dg times dg using tropical matrix multiplication and this is the length of a shortest path from um, city i to city j in the graph g. Right? So if you think about it for a moment, the way matrix multiplication works, so in classic matrix multiplication, this would make the generating function of all the paths. In the Boolean arithmetic, this would just give the existence of paths. But here, in this context, this computes the shortest path. So let's see an example. Let's say uh, I have a, a flight network with three cities. So let's say I have city one, city two, and city three. I have nine entries in my adjacency matrix. And uh, the diagonal entries are zero, and then here the edge weights are two, one, two, four in this example, and one, and five, so then the adjacency matrix would be zero, two, one, one, zero, four, five, two, zero. So the entry five means that to go from one to three, oh, I'm sorry, got it the wrong way around. Okay, but this way it's one, Two, one, now it's okay. Please check. Okay, so the two, one entry should be one, and then the one, two entry should be two. So if you now take this matrix DG and you multiply it with itself tropically, you get a, a matrix whose entries are possibly smaller. So DG squared is the matrix zero, two, one, no change there. Then one, zero, two in the second row, and then three, two, zero. So you can see that uh, we gained something when traveling from two to three. So from traveling to two to three in a non-stop flight, we have to pay four euro. But if we first go to one and then go here, then we get the price is only two. And likewise here, the entry is three. Um, because we can go from city three to city one by making a detour here and we save, you know, and we get, uh, get to three. So you see this algebraically by multiplying the matrix DG with itself. Okay, yes, question. Does the, does the product also tell you in which direction you should go? So what the shortest way actually can uh, only... Not the way I formulated here. So I formulated here, it only shows you the value. Um, but you can, of course, you know. So, of course, this is a classical discrete math problem, how you find such shortest paths. So there's Dijkstra's algorithm, there's Floyd Warshall's algorithm, and they are methods for evaluating this matrix product. So this is sometimes called dynamic programming in computer science or discrete math. So, so these dynamic programming algorithms, network people uh, know this very well. They are methods for carrying this out, this matrix multiplication. And of course, in carrying out the matrix multiplication, you can remember which steps you've taken, and then you learn uh, how to take the steps and how many optimal paths there are, and so on. So you can have enhanced versions of this. So yes, questions? Uh, the IJ is always just integer, or we can No, uh, well, the way I set it up, real non-negative real numbers. 
what would happen to length of the pass? It, it, it is a real number? It's a real number. It's a real number. So the arithmetic is here uh, over the real numbers. It could happen if there's no connection. So if the graph is not strongly connected to begin with, then you might see some infinity entries. But a priori, these are all real numbers. So these are real lengths. So it's not compatible with the lengths in uh, weighted directed graphs, the usual way. Well, the usual length if you put zeros and ones. So, I'm sorry, if you put, uh, yeah, if you put one, that would be the usual graph theoretic distance if all the edges have weight one, but you could put some other non-negative real numbers. If you put zeros, then you recover, you know, the Boolean operation would be to put the additive and multiplicatively neutral elements. So if you fill your matrix with zeros and infinities, then you just recover existence of paths. So zero being the multiplicatively neutral element and infinity being the additively neutral element. Okay, so this is called, as I said, so in computer science, this often goes as dynamic programming. is strategies for carrying out this uh, arithmetic in, in a fast way. Yes? Does this become stable, or in other words, do we simply have, like if we do this, say, say k times mm -hmm. this multiplication, then we have the a path with like, length at most k length in terms of like flight you have to take at most exactly k. exactly so so, so then it becomes stable after we can become stable so the way i set this up we become stable after n minus one step so the kth power records the length of a shortest path from i to j taking at most k steps but then on a graph with n nodes you know a shortest path from i to j will be a uh, can be organized to use at most n minus one steps if we have n nodes in total. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, metrics, finite metric spaces are idempotent matrices. So a matrix is idempotent if and only if this is a finite metric space. That is to say, if and only if all triangle inequalities hold simultaneously, right? So the reason we dropped from five to three is because there was a violation in the triangle inequality. This was not a metric space but this is a three-point metric space. Um, well, it's always good to practice tropical arithmetic, so I encourage you to do some of the exercises. So uh, exercise one is to take a, a polynomial, maybe ux, just a linear form, plus vy, plus uh, wz, and just look at some the nth power, right? So where x, y, and z are variables, u, v, and w are constants, like 3, 8, and 19. And the question is, what's the coefficient of this, you know, in, in some expansion? So for example, the coefficient of x squared, y cubed, z to the fifth, is some quantity that depends on u, v, and w. Now if this is a little too easy for you, you can make it more interesting. Maybe replace z by x times y and ask what's the coefficient of some x, y monomial? So what is the coefficient of x to the 17th times y to the 26th in the expansion of this where n is 8? I guess that's not good. n better be 26. Okay, um, so that's tropical arithmetic. Let's move on. So nonlinear algebra, as I said, is about extending linear algebra, in this case in the piecewise linear direction. So let's talk a little bit about tropical linear algebra. So let's talk more about these matrix operations and think more systematically about uh, linear algebra. So one concept we have in linear algebra is the notion of determinant. So in tropical arithmetic we have the tropical determinant. So the determinant is associated to a square matrix. So if we have an n by n matrix, which I call x with entries x, i, j. So think about these as unknowns or real numbers if you wish. Then the uh, tropical determinant by definition of x is defined by the expansion formula. So we take the sum, the tropical sum over all n factorial permutations pi. 
So pi runs over all permutations of one up to n. And then uh, we write down x1 pi 1, so that's the entry in row 1 and column pi 1 times x2 pi 2 times blah blah xn pi n. Right? That's the tropical determinant. So it's the usual formula for the determinant. The only thing that differs from the familiar formula and the familiar formula you have a sign. You would be very much like to put a sign, but there is no negation in tropical arithmetic, right? So tropical arithmetic has addition, it has multiplication. In fact, it has division too, but one thing it doesn't have is subtraction, right? There cannot be any number that we could call five minus three. Why is that? Because if there were such a number, then that number plus three would be five. But any number plus three is less than three, it's at most three. So there cannot be any number. That, uh, that, that's five minus. So in this setting, and we'll have a more systematic definition, uh, the minus one tropicalizes to zero. So in the classical determinant, we have certain coefficients called plus one or minus one, but all of these coefficients are replaced by zero. Every coefficient here is zero. We have n factorial sum ends, each with the coefficient zero, okay? That's a tropical determinant. Now. This also has a nice interpretation in terms of discrete math, namely evaluating the tropical determinant. Evaluating the tropical determinant solves the so-called assignment problem. Classical problem in uh, discrete optimization. And so the assignment problem is the following, suppose you have a, a company, describe it as follows, which, on, which has n workers, and on a given day, there are n jobs to be done, right? So there's n people who can do the job, n jobs to be done, so the goal is to find a bijection, to assign each person to each to a job. And uh, of course, we'd like to minimize the cost. So xij is the cost of assigning the ith worker to the jth job. To job J, okay, worker I to job J. Well, for a particular assignment, a particular assignment pi is the, uh, that's a permutation. And then if you choose the assignment pi, then this tropical product, which is the classical sum, is your total cost. The total cost is classically additive, and this tropical sum is the minimum. So you'd like to minimize over all n factorial Permutation, so this solves the assignment problem. Evaluating the tropical determinant is the same thing as uh, solving the assignment problem. Let's do an example. Let's take a matrix. So 1, 5, 0, 2, 7, 4, 0, 3, 2. So to calculate the tropical determinant, well, we could look at all six permutations, and the cheapest one would be 5. 2 tropically times 0 times 3, that makes 5. Any of the other permutations gives a bigger value. So this is a 3 by 3 determinant, 3 by 3 matrix of tropical determinant 5. One can use the Laplace expansion. So there is, there is a Laplace expansion. One has to be a little bit careful. So the way it's written here, the tropical determinant equals the tropical permanent. Now if you like complexity theory, that you know that the tropical determinant is an easy, the classical determinant is easy to evaluate, and the classical permanent is hard to evaluate. It's the mother of all sharp P complete problems is the evaluation of the classical permanent. They tropicalize to the same thing, but it turns out that uh, this is easy also in this case. So classically, we have an algorithm for the determinant. Let's call it Gaussian 
elimination, elimination um, runs in polynomial time. In the tropical case, there's something called the Hungarian method, Hungarian algorithm, and that also runs roughly in the same time. And uh, to first approximation, we can think about the Hungarian method as a tropicalization of Gaussian elimination, and these are polynomial time algorithms. Okay, so that is tropical determinant. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so remember this quartic? That's going to be one of the exercises we're going to come back to. Yes. Is there a coordinate-free version of tropical linear algebra? Ah, is there a coordinate-free version? Well, is there a coordinate-free is there a coordinate-free version of classical algebra? Well, you define what an abstract beta space is, then you prove the dimension theorem, then you have matrices are equal to. Yes. Uh, so that's a good question. So coordinate-free in classical math, what it means is invariance under the general linear group. So you have some object that's invariant under you know, n by n matrices, coordinate changes. And we, we don't have this in tropical geometry. There is a, a, free, a free version, but the group is smaller. Let me come back to this in about an hour. We're going to take the break today at 11.10, a little later. So I'm going to do about two-thirds of the lecture, then we take a break, and then there will be a shorter second half. I'm going to come back to this question in the shorter second half. So the first answer is no. but We'll get back to it. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, the answer, the solution of Hungarian algorithm is the same as determinant? It's the tropical determinant. So the Hungarian algorithm solves the assignment problem. So if you have a company with 20 workers and 20 jobs, the Hungarian method will find, will evaluate the determinant and find the best assignment. Of course, you don't want just the value, but you also like to actually have the argument. So exercise four is what is the tropical characteristic polynomial? Well, of course, the tropical characteristic polynomial should be the tropicalization of the classical characteristic polynomial. And I will tell you in about an hour how to tropicalize any polynomial, and therefore any concept in algebraic geometry, provided we fix a coordinate system. Okay? So the tropical characteristic polynomial is the tropical determinant of a modified matrix. So we take our original matrix, but we just add x, unknown x, along the diagonal. Remember, there is no subtraction in tropical math. So 2, 7 plus x, 4, 0, 3, 2, plus x. So we simply add x times the identity matrix. So the identity matrix has zeros along the main diagonal and infinity off the main diagonal. Right? So the identity matrix is a matrix that's the identity when multiplied with any other square matrix. On the diagonal, it has the multiplicatively neutral element 0. And off the diagonal has the additively neutral element plus infinity. So our matrix over here plus x times identity makes this one. And then the tropical determinant of this is x cubed. This is tropical plus 1x squared plus 0x plus 5. And of course, the leading coefficient here is also 0. Okay, All right, so. So along the diagonal, we have 0 times x cubed. The constant term is just the determinant that we had before. The coefficient of x squared is 1, right? Because here, x times x times 1 makes 1x squared. And then here, the coefficient of x is 0, and that's uh, the antidiagonal term. So x times 0, x 0 is the winner as far as the linear terms are concerned. So this is the tropical characteristic polynomial. Yes? And when you write x cubed, you also mean tropical? Everything is tropical. So by x cubed, I mean x tropical times x tropical times x. So Rafaela, 4 cubed is what? 
12. 12, okay? 4 cubed is 12. Okay, um, so if, now let's get, since we spoke about the uh, characteristic polynomial, maybe there is a relationship between the characteristic polynomial and the concept of eigenvalue. Maybe or maybe not. The characteristic polynomial and eigenvalues have something to do with each other. So let's talk about eigenvalues. So if A is an n by n matrix with entries A, I, J, and sometimes we write R bar for the extended real numbers. So if I throw in plus infinity, the neutral element in addition, then I'm going to write R bar. So then, for such a matrix, I'm going to say lambda, let me take it real, is called an eigenvalue. It's called an eigenvalue of A. If the following condition holds, if A, let's do this here, so if A times V, so this is the tropical multiplication of a square matrix and a column vector V, is equal to lambda v for some vector v in r to the n, and that will be called an eigenvector. So an eigenvector, eigenvalue pair is a pair lambda v that satisfies the familiar equation tropically for a given square matrix A. Let's do an example. Let's do the example up there. So. So for example, 1, 5, 0, 2, 7, 4, 0, 3, 2. So I claim that the column vector 0, 2, 0 is an eigenvector. And in this case, in fact, the eigenva eigenvalue is 0, right? So if you multiply this matrix on the right by 0, 2, 0, right? So then. Uh, 1 times 0 makes 1, 2 times 2 makes 4, but 0 times 0 makes 0, so we get 0, so you check that this is an equation. So in this case, 0 is the eigenvalue, and the 0, 2, 0 is an eigenvector. Now, of course, if you have any eigenvector, then any scalar multiple is also an eigenvector, right? So if I take uh, this vector, 0, 2, 0, and I multiply it by 5, it's still an eigenvector. So can multiply this by 5, we get 5, 7, 5. So that's still an eigenvector, right? So a scalar multiple of any eigenvector is also an eigenvector. Okay, so here's a theorem. I'm going to give you a theorem that characterizes eigenvalues. <clears throat> So theorem. Let's look at the graph G of A. Well, the graph is simply the weighted directed graph given by the square matrix A, right? Earlier, we took a directed graph and we wrote it as a matrix. But of course, any matrix is the adjacency matrix of a weighted graph. So by G of A, I mean the directed graph with nodes 1 up to n, where the weight of the edge from i to j is the entry a i j in the graph. So suppose this graph is strongly connected. That's a technical hypothesis. Well, we need this hypothesis because we allow the matrix to have entries infinity, right? So if there are lots of entries, infinity, then the graph could be disconnected. So for a directed graph is strongly connected if between any two nodes, i and j, there's a directed path from i to j. So the flight network of some airline is strongly connected if you can get from any city to any other city by some sequence of flights. Okay, so let's assume that. Of course, if the matrix A has only real entries, then it's, of course, then it's the complete graph, then it's strongly connected. So suppose it's strongly connected, then A has precisely one eigenvalue. 
which I'm going to write lambda of A, depends on A, okay? So any square real matrix has exactly one eigenvalue in tropical arithmetic, okay? Not less than one, not more than one. In fact, we can characterize this eigenvalue in graph theoretic terms. The eigenvalue of a matrix equals the minimum normalized length of any directed cycle in the graph. In the graph. So we look at all directed cycles, cycles of length one, cycles of length two, cycles of length three, and so on. That's a directed cycle. And then the normalized length is the classical average of the edge length. So if you have a cycle of length three, then you simply classically add the length of the edges and divide classically by three. Okay, that's the and then you take the minimum of all of these, you get the minimum normalized cycle length, and that is a number that depends on the matrix, and that number is the unique eigenvalue of the matrix. Let's do an example. So here for this matrix, um, I guess I erased the graph. So let's do this one, one, two, three. So. I have nine edges from one to two, and so on. I also have diagonal entries. They are becoming loops. And then I have to write down the edge weights. Let me do this in orange. So the diagonal entries are one, seven, and two. matrix, one, seven, and two. Then in row one, we have five, zero, zero here, two here, three here, and four there. And uh, now you can see, you look at all the directed cycles. So for example, this directed cycle here of length zero has normal length seven. This directed cycle here that connects one and two has normalized length 3.5. Then the directed cycle that goes around this way has normalized length three, but there's a two cycle here uh, that has length zero, normalized length zero, so that is the smallest normalized length, and that is indeed the eigenvalue of this matrix, the unique eigenvalue. Okay. Um, that's a very nice theorem. I think uh, this theorem that, eigen, that square matrices have exactly one um, eigenvalue is a very nice point of entry to piecewise linear algebra, that is to say tropical algebra. Let's elucidate this a little bit more by going to the next topic, which is towards polytopes. Yes? So, do we know negative weights in these? Like, and negative numbers are allowed. Yes. Yeah. And then can you have a... Yes. Yeah, but you only look at directed cycles, you know, over given length. Right. Edges are not repeated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just okay, so, yes. Is there any, like, graphical interpretation of, like, the eigenvector? We're going to get to eigenvectors in a moment, okay? Now, Tropical algebra, tropical math, is actually a very, very interesting subject. So the tropical semi-ring, it's named after Brazil, you know, and it, tropical arithmetic was invented and reinvented many, many, many times in the history in many different communities, all of which were outside core pure math. So in control theory and optimization, in many, many different communities, people invented the tropical semi-ring. And for example, um, this eigenvector problem is actually a very applied problem. So if you're a German reader, I recommend strongly, there's an article called Die Fahrplan Algebra. So the travel schedule, train schedule algebra. So in the, in the Netherlands, which has a very highly regular train system, uh, tropical algebra was used to optimize the train schedule. So if you have a discrete optimization problem with cyclic time behavior, such as the trains in the Netherlands, 
Then the eigenvector eigenvalue problem is, is very useful. So Spectrum der Wissenschaft, which is the German version, the Scientific American, so maybe 15, 20 years ago, had a very nice article called Die Fahrplan Algebra. Highly recommended. But let's get towards polytopes. And in fact, the eigenspace, which is the collection of all eigenvectors, is not, as you might think, linear space, but is a polytope. So let's get there. So, but first, let's talk about computing the eigenvalue question. Yeah. When you say strongly connected, you mean like you also have to consider the class between a vertex and itself, right? Because like, you may have. Uh, that is correct. If you just have one vertex. That's correct. Between any two nodes, there is a directed edge. In particular, there has to be a directed path from I to I. Yeah? So there's no edge. If there's an entry infinity, then that means there's no edge. So I want to have enough non-infinity entries in my matrix so that uh, there's an ed directed path from I to J between any two nodes I and J. That's strongly connected. If it's not strongly connected, well then each strongly connected component has their own eigenvalue. As a refinement of this theorem, then there could be different eigenvalues for different strong components of the graph. These things are also, by the way, uh, relevant for chemical reaction networks. So this can be thought of as a chemical reaction network in the tropical limit. So to compute the eigenvalue, of course, we do not list all many, 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 exponentially many cycles. Of course, we're going to apply a polynomial time algorithm to compute this. And this is based on linear programming. So to compute the eigenvalue, we consider the following LP. LP is linear program. And this linear program has n plus 1 decision variables. So the decision variables are v1 up to vn and lambda. And the v1 up to vn will be the coordinates, presumably, of an eigenvector. And the linear program we're going to solve is the following. Maximize gamma subject to a linear system of inequalities. So aij plus vj greater or equal gamma plus vi for all i and j. So i and j, so we go over all pairs of nodes, and we look at this system, okay? So we're going to go Aij plus Vj, which tropically is a product, is greater or equal to gamma plus Vi. So. Sorry, so this is the tropical sum? This is the classical sum. Oh. This is the classical sum. So this is a classical linear program. Now, if you unravel this, then the solutions, the feasible solutions to this, are so-called sub-eigenvectors. So these are sub-eigenvalue eigenvector pairs. And by sub, I mean that I'm referring to the minimum, right? So in the definition of eigenvector eigenvalue, we have a minimum, right? So in this equation, A times V, in each coordinate, we take the minimum of a bunch of things, right? And that minimum of a bunch of things should be lambda times, well, plus VI. Right, so on the right-hand side, the ith coordinate, we have the classical sum of lambda plus Vi. And that's supposed to be an equal on the left-hand side to be a minimum of n such things. By a sub-eigenvector, I mean a solution where this is minimum is not equal, but greater or equal. So if you unravel this, this is the definition of a sub-eigenvector. And then the proposition basically says, that's due to Dick Karp 30 years ago, that uh, sub-eigenvectors are, in fact, eigenvectors. So Karp says that lambda of A equals the optimal value. Of this linear program, it's very easy to solve linear program. And linear program, in any case, admits for polynomial time algorithms. So this is an efficient way. So if you have a 50 by 50 matrix and you want to solve, you know, find the eigenvector, eigenvalue, that's quite efficient. Then. 
you are lost in listing the cycles, but, but the linear program will be quite fast because there are only 51 decision variables in this very simple linear program. Okay, so now let's get to eigenvectors. There's a unique eigenvalue, so therefore there's a unique eigenspace. So next, how to compute the eigenspace. So the eigenspace of a matrix, square matrix, was well, the set of all column vector x that uh, satisfy the eigenvector eigenvalue equation. And we already know what's the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is this lambda, right? So we know the lambda. We're looking for all solutions of the equation ax equals lambda x, where a and lambda are now given, okay? Now to calculate the eigenspace, let's normalize. Let's observe that every eigenvector of A is also an eigenvector of a scaled matrix. And I'm going to scale B is minus, this is classical minus, times A. So what this says, I look at the number minus lambda, that's a real number, and I tropically multiply every entry of A by that number. That is to say, I add that number to every entry of A. Right? Now that makes sense classically, right? If you have a square matrix and you have an eigenvector, then every multiple of that matrix has the same eigenvector. The eigenvalue will change, but the eigenvector will remain an eigenvalue vector, right? So, so if you have an eigenvector of a square matrix, you multiply the matrix by 13, the eigenvector will still be an eigenvector. So we're normalizing and we're picking B to be this tropical scalar multiple of A. So then, what's the eigenspace? Well, the eigenspace of A is equal to the eigenspace of B but then the eigenspace is simply the fixed point locus. So it's a set of all x such that bx is equal zero x, right? So I'm normalizing. So this normalization takes the eigenvalue and replaces it by the eigenvalue zero, okay? Or in the graph theoretic sense, if I subtract lambda, the shortest cycle mean from every edge length, then afterwards, the shortest edge length is zero, right? So I'm normalizing things so that every cycle has normalized length non-negative and zero is attained by at least one directed cycle. Okay, so now that's the equation I want to solve. I'm given a matrix B and I like to find the fixed points of B. Solve the fixed point equation Bx equals x. Let's do the following. Let's calculate the so-called clean plus. Clean plus, clean is a name, it's not the opposite of dirty. So the clean plus of a square matrix is the following. So that's B plus. So this is B plus B squared. It's all tropical, plus, 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 up to the nth power. Right? So we saw earlier that matrix powers have something to do with the you know, shortest path and graph, uh, but now on the diagonal we no longer have zeros, unlike in the flight network, so we have to go up to the tropical nth power, so we take the tropical sum up to the nth power. We could go further, right? So the clean plus is basically the geometric series. So we have the geometric series B plus B squared plus B cubed and so on, but this is, uh, uh, enough to go up to the nth power, okay? So then with the clean plus, we have the following theorem. <clears throat> so theorem. Let's write B zero plus for the submatrix matrix 
or the submatrix of B plus given by some of the columns, given by those columns, given by those columns, whose diagonal entry is zero. Whose diagonal entry B plus JJ is zero. So I claim that in the B plus, there is at least one column that has an entry zero in the diagonal entry. There's at least one diagonal entry that's zero. Now let's first of all note that all the diagonal entries are non-negative, right? Because the shortest cycle mean is zero. If there were a negative entry, then there would be a zero cycle, right? A one cycle of negative cycle length. So the diagonal entries are non-negative. But of course, there are some that are zero. Namely, if you are a node and you live on a shortest cycle, then your entry is zero, right? So if in this directed graph, there's a shortest cycle that's all zero, then in the clean plus, you just travel around the cycle to get by yourself, and that costs you zero. That's a pretty cheap way of making a round trip from your city, okay? So there's some cities, the way we set this up, there's some city J, possibly many cities J, that have a diagonal entry zero, meaning you can travel for free. To yourself. Okay, so that's the hypothesis, and then the conclusion okay, is zero, so then the conclusion is here, so then the eigenspace of B, and therefore the eigenspace of A, is the image of this matrix. So B zero plus is given by some columns of B plus, so it's a some, it's an N by something matrix. Right? So this matrix still has N rows, but it might have fewer columns. So it, it's a map, right? It's an N by something matrix. So it maps something dimensional space into N dimensional space by matrix multiplication. It has an image as the matrix, and that image is equal to the eigenspace of B. Let's see an example. Uh, yes. So this, this this is now the classical image or the tropical image? This is the tropical image, the image under tropical multiplication. So this is matrix multiplication. So if I have a four by two matrix, then I have a tropical linear map from R2 to R4, given by right multiplying a column vector of length two against a four by two matrix that makes a column vector of length four. And then the image is the set of all vectors you get this way. And do we have a um, the, the dimension theorem or? Uh, well, we'll get to a dimension. Do you rank nullity theorem? Is that what what you I mean, so in linear algebra, a matrix corresponds to a map because every vector space is a basis. Yes. Does this have a corresponding? Uh, well, so here I haven't gotten to linear spaces yet. We're not going to get to linear. We may never get to linear space in this lecture. Tropical linear space are quite complicated objects. Tropical polytopes, on the other hand, are easier. So let's get to tropical polytopes first. So let's do this one. Let me explain this by way of an example. Okay, so we identify. So first of all, we're gonna draw this image, this set. So by this set, I mean the image so the image of a matrix, an n by something matrix, right? So I have an n by something matrix, so the image is a subset of R to the n. We're gonna identify this set with its image in R to the n times the classical one-dimensional subspace spanned by the all one vector, okay? Now this Rn modulo classically, the image, the, the span of the one, 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 one vector, well classically that's a linear space of dimension n minus one. Now why is this natural? This is sometimes called, uh, sometimes it's called the projective space, right? Because this is modding out by tropical scalar multiplication, right? In this quotient, this classical quotient, I'm identifying two vectors if they differ by a tropical scalar multiple, right? So for example, 
the vector 2, 3, 5 and the vector 3, 4, 6, well, they are the same in this quotient. And that's the second vector is just one times the first vector. Right? So this is sometimes called the tropical projective space. And uh, this makes for easier pictures because if you're in the image of a matrix, then every tropical scalar multiple will be also in the image. Right? So the image will be invariant here, will, you know, under the shifting. So to draw this, it's convenient to do this. So since it, namely the image of a matrix, is closed under tropical scalar multiplication. Let's do an example. So to get an interesting eigenspace, let's take this matrix A. So 3, 4, 4, 4, 3, oh, let's do 4 on the diagonal. 3, whoops, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4, 3. Okay, so it's a 3 by 3 matrix. I put 3s on the diagonal and 4s off the diagonal. Now the eigenvalue is 3, right, because the uh, zero cycles are shortest. The uh, B in this example is equal to B plus is equal to B plus 0 is this matrix. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, I'm sorry, 1, 1, 0, right? So we uh, tropically multiply this matrix by minus 3. That gives us B. That B is already equal to its clean plus, and then you can see there are zeros in every diagonal entry, so B plus is equal to B plus zero. Okay? So the goal now is to calculate the image of this matrix. Okay? So the image of this matrix is calculated as follows. You take any vector on the right, you multiply it tropically, you get another vector of length three. Right? Such a vector is in the image. Now, this image will be a subset of R3, but this subset is invariant under tropical scalar multiplication. That is to say, it's invariant under sliding along the main diagonal, the 1, 1, 1 main diagonal. So we're going to mod out, in my drawing the picture now, I'm going to mod out the 1, 1, 1 main diagonal, and the picture looks like this. <clears throat> The eigenspace, in this case, looks like this. So it looks like a classical hexagon, seven lattice points. So here's the lattice point, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. This is the origin, zero, 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 one, zero. 0, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1, okay? Now these are column vectors of length 3, but they are thought of modulo tropical scalar multiplications. When I write 1, 0, 1, that's the same as 7, 6, 7, or it's the same as minus 8, minus 9, minus 7, right? So that's, that's this point. Now, of course, in the image, you can see the column vectors of the matrix, right? So so here is the first column vector of the matrix. Here is another column vector of the matrix. And down here is a third column vector of the matrix. And uh, this is the eigenspace. So the eigenspace is this subset of R3 visualized as a point in the tropical projective plane. So this clear, right? So if you take any point here, take any point here and you multiply it against this matrix, then you get that back. That's the fixed point locus, okay? So this is the eigenspace of A, it's the eigenspace of B, and it's also the image of B in this example, okay? That's the image of B. Okay, so definition. The image of a tropical linear map from Rm to Rn, okay? So that's a linear map given by an N by M matrix, and you right multiply with the column vector. So the image of such a map is called a tropical polytope. 
It is not, 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 not a tropical linear space. It is not a tropical linear space. Okay, so the image of a matrix is a polytope. Okay, now this leads to the concept of tropical convexity. So the previous theorem, what it says is that eigenspaces of square matrices are tropical polytopes. We took a square matrix A, we built another typically non-square matrix B0 plus, and we argue that the eigenspace of A is equal to the image of this other matrix B0 plus. So therefore eigenspaces are tropical polytopes. Now tropical convexity is conveniently formulated in this quotient space. There's an excellent book that hasn't appeared yet, but you can get it online. So Michael Joswig in Berlin has a book called Essentials of Tropical Combinatorics. So everything I said so far is really a uh, um, about tropical combinatorics, and I'll give you one more example, and then we'll take the break. <clears throat> so the connection to graphs, to network problems, to eigenvectors, all that is beautifully contained in the book called Essentials of Tropical Combinatorics, which you can find online on Michael Joswig's homepage. Let's do one more example. Let's take another example. Let's look at the columns of the following matrix. So 0, 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 1, 0, 0. So let's calculate the image of this matrix. Right? Now, I claim that this image is a polytope called a triangle. So they span a so-called triangle in the plane. And by the plane, we mean R3 mod R11. So R3 mod 111, to some people, that's the root lattice of type AN. So that's a plane. That's kind of the projective plane, right? So because I can choose homogeneous coordinates, the point 2, 3, 5 is the same as the point 4, 5, 9. Right? They differ just by a scalar multiple. Um, now, when you work in the projective plane, often what you do is you change, right? So you make the last coordinate, well, what you do is you choose affine coordinates. Italians do this in elementary school. You choose affine coordinates to, you pick one of the coordinates to be the multiplicatively neutral element. You scale your vectors so that maybe the last coordinate is the multiplicatively neutral element. Let's do the same, right? So that's a, uh, Scale the last coordinate, so the first vector is really the same as minus 1, minus 1, 0, and otherwise we're really good, 0, 3, 0, 2, 1, 0, right? So A and A prime, they have the same image, right? So A and A prime are just normalized the last row to consist of multiplicatively neutral element 0, right? So, okay, so now I can draw this, right? So uh, let's draw this in the plane. So now I just draw the picture in the affine plane, right? So I have minus one, minus one. That's the point here, that's one. And then there's this point, three, right? So this, this is the, I guess that's the origin, right? So that's at minus one, minus one. And then three is at two, one, right? So okay. one, two, and one over, and then there's another point two here. And the tropical triangle is this shape. It's this line segment, that line segment, and that line segment together with this triangle filled in. Just like skateboarding and skiing, this requires practice, right? If you skied all your life, it's not so difficult, but if you do this for the very first time in your 20s, it requires practice, like playing the violin. Calculating the image of a three by three matrix requires practice, and I encourage you to do this practice. So this is the image of this matrix. Now there are more 
combinatorial types. There are 35 combinatorial types of tropical triangles. You can find them listed, for example, in Josvik's book. You can find them listed in my book with Diane McLagan. The tropical rainforest has a very, very wealthy biodiversity. There are many, many more possibilities in the tropical rainforest than in the northern forest, so there are 35 types of tropical triangles. Each tropical triangle is a classical polyhedral complex consisting of one two-dimensional cell, six one-dimensional cells, and six zero-dimensional cells. And we saw two examples, one that's not classically convex like this one, and the other example that was a classical hexagon that was classically convex. Let's take a seven-minute break, and then we get from tropical combinatorics to tropical algebra. Question. Uh, is, uh, is there any relation between the dimension of this polytope and the rank of the mass? That is, that's a very good question. So the question is, uh, what's the relationship between the rank of the matrix and the, and the dimension of the polytope? And the tropical rank of a matrix is exactly one more than the dimension of the polytope. So there is different notions of rank. And one of the notions of rank is the dimension of this polytope plus one. Okay, so we talked about tropical arithmetic, tropical algebra, matrix algebra, but we really haven't talked about the connection to classical algebra, right? So the, game of the, the, the goal of the course is to extend linear algebra to nonlinear algebra. We took a step in the piecewise linear combinatorial direction, but how to tie this in now with classical nonlinear algebra. So we need a field. We're gonna fix an algebraically closed field. And today we're gonna to look at fields that have evaluation. So I'm gonna give you an example. So for example, K is the field of Peugeot series. So T is an unknown, a formal parameter. So these are power series in T with rational number exponents and uh, they allow it to start at a negative rational number, they go on. And the only constraint is that the uh, set of rational numbers that you see should be, have a bounded denominator, okay? So algebraically closed field evaluation, that's an algebraically closed field, the Peugeot series. Um, or to make it a little simpler, you could take rational functions in T and take the algebraic closure. I still don't like this, right? Because you, nobody can write down a complex number, nobody can write down a real number either, right? So, so to make a field, those elements you can actually email, we have to do this, right? So if we take uh, rational functions in one unknown t with rational number coefficients and take the algebraic closure, so, so here's a, a field whose elements I can email you. This field is contained in this field is contained in that field, okay? These are bigger fields. So t is a formal parameter. Think of it as a small quantity t. t is a small formal parameter. The valuation, the value of a scalar in this field is the smallest power of t that you see, right? Now, depending on your mathematical upbringing, you might have seen this kind of thing. So, for example, if, uh, if you like physics or combinatorics, then t is q. If you like calculus, then t is epsilon. If you like number theory, then t is p. If you're me, t is t, okay? So t is just a formal parameter. Now let's do maybe two examples. So let's say the scalar, I take t squared plus two t cubed plus t to the fifth, so it's just the polynomial in t. So this has valuation two, but of course I'm in a field, so I can invert this, and then this has valuation negative two, right? So if you expand this into a power series in t, then the power series starts t, to the minus two plus higher stuff. Let's do another example. So maybe uh, let's look at another C, C prime. So T to the, to the power two sevenths times the square root of one plus T to the two third, right? So this you can expand into a power, into a series in T. And this has valuation two sevenths, right? You expand it 
as a, as a power series in T. So this is what we mean. So it's an algebraically closed field, but this field has a valuation, and the valuation measures the order of vanishing or pole in T or epsilon. Now given any classical polynomial, or given a polynomial, f in several variables. So c1 is a coefficient, x to the a1 plus c2, x to the a2 plus plus, cs x to the as. So that's a polynomial in n variables, x1 up to xn, having s terms, the ith exponent ai is an integer vector, well, I might allow negative integers. I'm not so uh, strict here. So ai is a, an integer vector of length n. And then ci is a scalar in the field t, okay? such as c and c prime. So given such a classical polynomial, we can define its tropicalization as follows. So the tropicalization of a classical polynomial is a tropical polynomial. is the following tropical polynomial. It's basically the same polynomial except the arithmetic is tropical. So, so the tropicalization of the classical polynomial f, each coefficient is replaced by its valuation and each monomial is replaced by the corresponding tropical monomial and the sum is replaced by the tropical sum. The second term becomes the valuation of C2, that's a typically a rational number, times x to the power A2, tropically, plus, 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 tropically, x to the tropical power uh, AS, whose coefficient again is the valuation of CS. Okay? That's the tropicalization. Now, if your field, it's, it's allowed here that the field um, has trivial valuation. So for example, if you take real numbers or complex numbers and every non-zero field element has value zero, if that is so, then every coefficient is zero. Right? So if you take, for example, a classical polynomial, such as the two by two determinant or the n by n determinant, right, where the classical coefficients are plus or minus one, every classical coefficient like plus or minus one has valuation zero. Therefore, the tropical determinant is the tropicalization in this sense of the classical determinant. Now, of course, this expression is a minimum, right? So this is something, min, something, min, something, right? So to evaluate this, you take the minimum of s things. And if this minimum, if this minimum of F S things is attained twice, that is to say at least twice, at some value, let's say U, then we're gonna say that such a point U in Rn is a tropical zero. of this tropical polynomial. Okay. So a tropical polynomial evaluated classically is the minimum of S tropical monomials. A tropical monomial is an affine linear form classically, right? So for example, if you take uh, T squared times X times Y cubed, right, then its tropicalization is two times x times y squared, tropically. And then we take the minimum of these things, and that classically would be two plus x plus three y. So the minimum is attained twice, then we're gonna say that this is a tropical zero. Now that is a meaningful definition because that captures the essence of classical zero, so propositions. So suppose you have a classical point with coordinates z1 up to zn, in the field k to the n. Right? So I have a vector of length n whose coordinates zi look like this, the elements in the field. If that is a classical zero 
in the usual classical sense of the classical polynomial f, then this gives rise to a tropical zero. Right? Then its valuation by which I mean the coordinate wise valuation, val of z1 plus plus val of zn is a, that's, you know, in my fields, that's now a vector in q to the n, is a tropical zero of the tropical polynomial. Right? That's important to understand. Right? So if you have a classical polynomial, suppose you plug in a classical value, right? Well, you look at the order in t, but it has to be zero, right? There has to be at least two terms that cancel, right? So if you have something, classically plus something, plus something, plus something is zero, and each of the things you see is a power series in t, then the lowest term has to be attained twice. That we're seeing, right? There has to be some term where the lowest term occurs, it must be canceled somewhere else against the lowest term. Okay. That's what it means to be evaluation. So if you have a classical zero, then the coordinate-wise valuation, the coordinate-wise valuation is simply, you record the order, the lowest order in T that you see in each coordinate, that is a tropical zero. That is to say, if you plug in, then the minimum is attained twice. Let's see an example. Now it's good to practice this in one variable. So if you've never done this before, then you practice this in one variable. If you never skied before, you practice on the bunny slope, right? You don't go down the double black diamond first, but you'd practice on the bunny slope. Blue or green, whatever. So n equals one, very, very green. So f is t x cubed minus x squared plus three t minus two t to the fifth, okay? So this is a classical polynomial in one variable x of degree three, and we like to find its variety at zero. So let's tropicalize this polynomial, right? So the tropical polynomial, well, it's the same polynomial, except we record the valuation. So t has valuation one, so you go a one x cubed plus zero x squared, 3t has, again, valuation 1 times x, and then the constant term is 5, right? Because this has valuation 5. So the tropical polynomial is 1x cubed plus 0x squared plus 1x plus 5, okay? Now, what are the zeros, the, the classical zeros? So the classical zeros, well, that you can find either you memorize Cardano's formula and then do the power series expansion, or you do the Peugeot series algorithm. Every, most every, computer algebra system will do Peugeot series. Five of you have a handout that tells you how to do this in Maple. I use Maple, so in Maple you load the algebraic curves package and you say Peugeot. That's the name of a person, P-U-I-S-E-U-X, and I will give you the roots. Okay, and some of you have this in the handout. So the zeros, the classical zeros look like this. T to the minus one plus higher order terms. Then you go three T plus plus higher order terms. And the last root is two thirds T to the fourth plus higher order terms. So these are the three classical roots of a classical polynomial of degree X in three variables. And again, if you like calculus, think about T as being epsilon. If you like number theory, think about P, T as P, a prime number. So an example of such a field is the field of seven adic numbers. So if you like the prime number P, then you can expand your rational numbers happily into increasing powers of seven. Of course, if you like numerical analysis, you take your numbers and happily write them as increasing powers of 10 to the minus one. Not quite evaluation, but almost. Okay. Very good, so these are the three classical roots. Now you can take the valuation of the three classical roots, they will be the tropical roots. So the tropical zeros are the valuations of the classical zeros. So the classical zero starts t to the minus one plus lots of stuff, 
But all we need to remember is minus 1. Then we have 3t, valuation is 1. Then here we have t to the fourth, valuation is 4. Right? So, so this classical polynomial has three roots, minus 1, 1, and 4. So for example, 4 is a root. If you plug in 4, here you get 4 cubed, which is 12. We learned earlier, so that's 13. That's 8, that's 5, that's 5. Minimum is attained twice, right? You have four numbers, 13, 8, 5, and 5. Minimum is attained twice, so therefore this is a root. Let's try 1. Okay, so 1 times 1 cubed makes 2. 1 squared is 2. Oops, not true. Oh, that's wrong, right? I messed up. So 1 cubed is actually 3, so that's 4, uh, 2, 2, 5, so we have 4. 2, 2, 5, minimum is attained twice. Okay, let's try again, negative 1, here we get negative 2, here we get negative 2, here we get negative 1, here we get 5, minimum is attained twice. So these are the roots. Now of course, if you have a polynomial in one variable and you know all the roots, then you can factor that polynomial into linear factors, right? It's a constant times the product of linear factors, and indeed, this polynomial, so, you take the leading coefficient out, you get 1, then you go x plus minus 1, tropically times x plus 1, tropically times x plus 4, and you multiply out this product of three linear expressions in one variable x, and you recover our polynomial of degree 3. That's how you solve a polynomial of degree 3 in one variable. Look for values where the minimum is attained twice, and that makes sense by virtue of this proposition that says the tropical zeros are the shadows, the image of the classical zeros under the coordinate-wise valuation. Any question? Yes? The converse of the proposition. Yes, we get to that. The converse holds also. That's a little harder, but it holds. Exercise 11. Find the zeros. Well, here's an exercise, I already gave away the answer. So, it's a polynomial of degree 4. So, t plus t squared, x plus t cubed, t uh, x squared plus t to the 6th, x cubed, plus t to the 10, x to the 4th. So, find the roots in x. The, uh, Exercise asks you to do this classically and tropically. Well, the answer was on this blackboard 90 minutes ago, and four of you have it in the handout. So there are four power series with integer exponents that start with the lowest power. Two of them have real coefficients, two of them have complex coefficients. Those are the four classical roots. You can find the four classical roots by either remembering Cardano's formula or solving this somehow, or you type Puseur into a computer algebra system, for example, Maple. But tropically, it's even easier, right? So tropically, you look at the tropical polynomial. The tropical polynomial is equal to 1 times, so 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus 6x cubed plus 10x to the fourth. Right? And you can now calculate the zeros. So this polynomial has four zeros. There's going to be a double zero, and then there's a single zero. So 1 is a double root, right? If you plug in 1, then I guess minus 1. Sorry, if you plug in minus 1, then this becomes 1 minus 1 minus 1. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. 3, 6, okay? So minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 3, 6. Minimum is attained thrice. So therefore, that's a double root. Uh, then here we get, uh, I guess, negative 
3, let's try that. So if we plug in negative 3, we get 1, minus 1, minus 3, minus 3, minus 2. So negative 3. Um, and then also negative 4. So we plug in negative 4. So minus 4 to the 4 is minus 16. So we get minus, am I doing this right? We get 10, I'm sorry. So minus 4 to the 4th power, so that's uh, minus 16, minus 6, is that true? Yeah. And then here we get uh, 12, oh yeah, that's okay, right? So 10 minus 16, the people with the handout, so there's one more root. What's the lowest term? T to the minus, is it minus four? Or is it minus five? Minus three. Minus three? Okay, there are three of them, right? So four. Minus four, yeah, minus four. So why, why is it minus four? Let's try again. So two times minus four is minus two. Uh, minus eight plus three, that's uh, minus five. Okay, minus four times to the third power is minus 12, plus six is minus six, minus six, thank you. Okay, so we're good, okay? So those are the tropical zeros. So if you don't remember the command Peugeot, or if your computer algebra system doesn't have Peugeot series, you do this first. Right? That's how you first, that's how you find the lowest term, and that's how you make the power series solution. So. To solve polynomials in one variable, you first find the lowest term, you plug in, you find the next term, and so on. Just like solving differential equations with power series, we do it one term at a time, tropically. Okay, um, algebraic varieties. Okay, I have a few questions. Yes. What happens if the minimum gets attained five times? Well, then it's a five-fold root. Fourfold. Fourfold, Fourfold. yes, exactly. Yeah. So again, we can factor this polynomial, right? Let's factor it. So it's one times x plus negative two squared times x plus negative three times x plus negative four. And that's correct, right? Multiply out, you get the right thing. Uh, I guess the con, I'm sorry, it should be 10. So let's go uh, 10, okay? So leading term is 10x to the fourth. The lowest term is the product of the roots. So it's uh, whatever it is, minus two times minus three times minus four times 10 makes one. Question. Yeah, at the beginning, we uh, simplified this binomial theorem to the question three. Does it change the zero? I mean, it's a polynomial, you can consider it to be a polynomial, right? In x and y. But then we took out two terms that would appear normally by ah. knowing about the properties of minimum. Very, very minimum. good question. Okay, let me address that. That's a very, very good question. Okay, let's look at uh, an expression like this. Zero plus x squared. Now that's a polynomial. And oh, let, let's make it more interesting. Three plus five x squared. So this has a double root at negative two. That's okay, right? However, what I can do is I can add a linear term. So let me add a linear term, 194 times x, okay? Now that changes the polynomial, but it doesn't change the function, right? So this polynomial represents a function from the real line to the real line. If you plug in any value of x, it didn't change anything, right? Because 194 is so big, it never wins in the minimum. Right? So I've changed the polynomial, so two different formal polynomials can represent the same function. Now classically, we only know this in finite characteristics. So in characteristic zero, this doesn't happen classically. It happens in characteristic p, but not in characteristic zero. But tropically, it happens. So when I wrote down the factorization, both here and in the binomial theorem, I meant as a function, not as a formal polynomial, right? So, so as a function, these are the same. So 
of every real number, they are the same number, right? Because the last term is so big, it can never win. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so that, that was the factorization I wrote was as a function. Tim? The tropical zeros depend on the polynomial. The tropical zeros depend only on the function, only on the function. But the factorization as a formal polynomial depends on the polynomial. So I fudged a little bit. So, so when I wrote down that when I said it factors, I mean it factors as a function. So if you have a tropical polynomial, I can write down a product of tropical linear forms such that that polynomial represents the same function as the polynomial you started with. Very good, excellent point. Now nonlinear algebra is about solutions to nonlinear algebraic equations. These are varieties. Okay. So, so far we talked about combinatorics in the beginning today, and we talked for a couple minutes about polynomials in one variable. Now let's talk about polynomials, about polynomials in more than one variable. Let's talk about varieties. So to set this up classically, let's work in the Laurent polynomial ring. So I'm working in a polynomial ring, x1, x2, up to xn, but it's a little nicer to allow negative exponents. So these are so-called Laurent polynomials. The ring of Laurent polynomials in n variables, x1 up to xn, with coefficients in my field k, and think about this field. Or as I said, if you like piadics, you know, there are many, many, many valued fields. In fact, in Berkeley we have a logic group, and there's a group that's very, very strong in model theory, okay? And once you speak to logicians, you have no idea how many fields there are, okay? There are many, 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 many fields, and these fields have properties that are much weirder than anything you ever dreamt of, okay? So please talk to your model theory friends and ask them to tell you a couple fields, okay? So these are some harmless. These are some harmless fields, okay? But there are lots of fields out there. Anyway, so K is one of these fields, and I take the Laurent polynomial ring in n variables over this field. Now, elements of this field, so this is classical, right? So elements F here are Laurent polynomials. Polynomials define hypersurfaces. But now we're in the Laurent polynomial ring, so this is the algebraic torus. So k star to the n, so the algebraic torus is n tuples of non-zero scalars, and then the coordinate ring of this algebraic torus is the Laurent polynomial ring, or said differently, the spectrum of the Laurent polynomial ring is k star to the n, the algebraic torus. Now, suppose you have a real vector, typically with rational coefficients. And let's define the initial form with respect to these weights in sub u of f is the subsum of all terms. C prime bar, classically, this is a classical polynomial times x to the ai, where the valuation of ci times u to the ai is minimal, and something else is the case, okay? You take a Laurent polynomial. It's a linear combination uniquely of monomials, Laurent monomials, right? So you have a scalar x to the a1. Scalar is a classical polynomial. Scalar x to the a2. Scalar x to the a3. So for each of these monomials, you look at, you plug in u tropically, and you, you know, take this expression, the valuation of ci plus u to the ai, right? Now we know if this you know, were a tropical zero, the minimum would be attained twice, but the minimum is going to be attained somewhere, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe five times. Right? Since you asked about five times, maybe five times, maybe once. It's going to be attained. 
I want to focus on those indices i where the minimum is attained. But then the fine print is that ci bar is the term of lowest order in ci, okay? Now, not to confuse you, think about CI as a preserved series. Think about CI as a power series in T. So rather than taking the whole power series in T, you just take the lowest term in this power series. So CI is a power series, and CI bar is the lowest term in this power series. So this works over any field, K, including all of those fields that your model theorist friends will be happy to share with you. Okay. So that's the initial form. So every classical polynomial, f, given a weight vector u, has a classical initial form. You're familiar with this in the context of Grobner bases, right? In the context of Grobner bases, we have monomial orderings. The very first lecture in this ring for laser was about Grobner bases. So we have monomial orderings that have initial monomials, but here we have initial forms, right? So if we give weights that might possibly break ties, then we have initial forms. Now, the following lemma holds. So suppose you have a classical polynomial, and you have a vector in R to the n. Then the following conditions are equivalent. T, F, A, E, the following are equivalent. One, the initial form is not a monomial, that is to say, is not a unit, not a unit in the raw polynomial, i.e., not a monomial. So the units are exactly the monomials. Condition two is that u is a tropical zero of the tropical polynomial. That's an easy lemma. It's basically what we said earlier, right? So if you look at all these terms, to be a tropical zero means the minimum is attained twice, and the minimum is attained twice at the classical level means the initial form is, has at least two terms. It's at least a binomial, therefore it's not a monomial, therefore it's not a unit in the lower polynomial. Okay, so these two things are equivalent. Now, of course, in nonlinear algebra, we're looking at solution set not just for a single polynomial, but for many polynomials and n variables, and we organize these polynomials into an ideal. So therefore, let i be an ideal. Let i be an ideal in the Laurent polynomial ring. And v of i its classical variety, its variety. I as an ideal, V of I, as always, is the variety. Then there's an associated tropical variety. And maybe this is such an important concept, let's first erase, and then let's write that on a very clean, pristinely clean blackboard on the left side. We have a system of many polynomials and n variables. We allow negative integer exponents in our terms as a classical variety. And now we're going to tropicalize this classical variety, and we get a tropical variety. OK, so one of the participants is still worried about things depending on coordinates. So maybe let me relieve you now. Okay. So in classical geometry, we're working typically in an affine or projective space. And being geometric means to be invariant under the coordinate changes in projective space. That is to say, the general linear group. Here, the intrinsic geometry takes place inside a torus, k star to the n. In that k star to the n, we also have an automorphism group, but it's small. Right? The automorphism group of this torus is small. Algebraic automorphisms are characters. Right? Everything I say is invariant under coordinate changes, hence geometric in the sense of Felix Klein. Okay? So 
with respect to this ambient space, everything I say is coordinate free, except the ambient space is not the one you're familiar with from projective geometry. This is particularly hard to take for Italians. <laughs> okay, um, let's do it. So the tropical variety, <clears throat> the associated, so I have a classical variety, the associated tropical variety, and I give you two characterizations. I'm going to give you first an equational characterization. So the tropicalization of the classical variety is the set of all u in r to the n, such that this condition, where's the equivalent condition? Uh, did I erase it? I just said two things are equivalent over here. One and two, such that one and hence two, holds for all polynomials f in the ideal. I mean all. I is an ideal. It contains infinitely many Laurent polynomials. Okay. I did not say just take generators. I said take all polynomials f in the ideal. So this condition in the lemma, the equivalent condition in the lemma holds for all polynomials then I'm going to call u a tropical zero. The set of all tropical zeros is, by definition, the tropical variety of the classical ideal I. Now, there are two big theorems which I like to state, briefly discuss, and then the time will be up. So there's the fundamental theorem of tropical algebraic geometry, and that's the converse you were asking for. So the fundamental theorem is the converse. It says the following. The tropical variety is equal to the image of the classical variety V of I under the valuation map. That is to say the coordinate wise Valuation map. Okay. In one variable, we've seen that, we discussed it. Five of you have a handout where this was done for the principal ideal i generated by a single quartic in one variable. Right? So in one variable, all we're saying is we take the classical variety, the roots, we look at the valuation, the lowest terms you see in the handout. That's the tropical variety. This holds always. For any system of polynomials and n variables, this will be true. Now there's a little bit of fine print. Um, let me put closure of the here. Well, if you work in preserve series, the value group is the group of rational numbers. So if you take any classical root, then when you calculate the coordinate wise valuation, it will be a vector of rational numbers. But we talked about these tropical varieties being r to the n, right? So the rational numbers are not quite r. So that's why I have to sneak in the closure. So there are two ways to deal with this. Either you write closure here, or you make the field bigger. Right? So one way to deal with this, you allow for power series with real exponents. That makes the field slightly weird, but you can do it. Or you write closure here. So up to closure, the tropical variety is the image of the classical variety under the coordinate-wise valuation. So you can either first solve the classical system and then just take the image or you just use this definition over here. Now, of course, here I said that we look at all polynomials in the ideal, but if there's a finite basis called a tropical basis, which a posteriori suffices, okay? So a posteriori, every ideal has a finite subset called a tropical basis, and you can replace this infinite set of polynomials F by a finite tropical basis. Keyword here. This tropical basis, if you want to make this finite. Let's do the simplest example. Let's talk about a line. A line in the plane. By the plane, let's write k star squared. Okay? 
Suppose I have a line in the plane. Suppose I would like to solve the equation x plus y plus 1 equals 0 okay. over my field. OK. So I can take x to be t to the 11. I can take y to be 1 minus, no, minus 1 minus t to the 11, and that's a perfectly good solution. Okay. That tropicalizes to the point 0, 0. Okay. Or I could do something else. I could take x to be t to the minus 8. I'm sorry, this tropicalizes to, what is it, 11, 11, 0. Okay. Or I can take this to be t to the minus 8. I can take this to minus t to the minus 8 minus 1. And that tropicalizes to minus 8 minus 8. Right? So every classical point on the classical line, we're, we're solving the fall. Don't tell anybody, OK? Professor taught you how to solve one linear equation and two variables, x and y. Not so hard, OK? But you take all of these points and you take the coordinate wise valuation, then, you know, you get this picture. That's a tropical line. This is the point minus 8, minus 8. That's the point 11, 0, the two points we just discussed. This is a tropical line. A tropical line is the image of a classical line under the coordinate wise valuation. Now, a second big theorem after the fundamental theorem is the structure theorem. Somebody asked about the dimension and the rank of matrices earlier, so let's talk a little bit about structure and dimension. So the structure theorem in tropical algebraic geometry says the following. The structure of a tropical variety is, this is a balanced, I'll define that, polyhedral complex In fact, Q-rational polyhedral complex whose dimension equals that of the classical variety. Okay? So, a polyhedral complex is a finite union of convex polyhedra that fit together nicely. It's a collection of convex polyhedra, the intersection of any two of which is a common face of each. I say this again. It's a collection of polyhedra. A polyhedron is the solution set to a system of linear inequalities, linear form less or equal a constant. Okay? So I'm interested in a collection of polyhedra the intersection of any two of which is a common face of each. That's a polyhedral complex. Balanced means locally, well, Q rational means everything is defined over the rational numbers. Balanced means the following. Locally, at every point, so if you take a point here, so that's a face of co-dimension one, and then in any emanating direction, you take the first integer point. Right? So every cone that you see, is defined over Q. Every ray that you see is defined over the rational number. So if you start at the origin along a rational ray, there will be a first beep integer point. If you add up those integer vectors, you get zero. That's called balanced. So if these cones play tug of war, nobody wins. That's what balanced means. Okay? It's an equilibrium condition. And dimension means dimension. Okay? These are linear spaces. This is actually a very nice theorem for many, many reasons. For example, in commutative algebra, there are many different definitions of dimension. And they're complicated, like chains of prime ideals, degrees of Hilbert polynomials. If you don't like those definitions, you can take this as the definition of dimension. So this is a definition of dimension of i. So that's the structure theorem. So time is basically up. Um, let's talk about some examples um, in the afternoon, if you like. <coughs> So here's an example that's uh, in the notes. So it's an example that's n equals 9. 
Let's take I to be the principal ideal of the 3 by 3 determinant. Okay, that's a nice ideal. So uh, we are on a raw polynomial ring in nine variables. So we have a polynomial ring in nine variables. x11, x12, x13, x21, x22, x23, x31, x32, x33. Those are the names of our variables. The 3 by 3 determinant is a certain cubic polynomial with six terms in this polynomial ring, like x11 times x22 times x33 minus x11 times x23 times x32, and so on. Okay, that's the determinant. I look at the principal ideal. The variety is singular matrices. Right? So, so V of i is the variety of all 3 by 3 singular matrices. So this is a cubic hyposurface. in nine-dimensional space. So it's an eight-dimensional variety, irreducible, eight-dimensional variety in nine-dimensional space. So therefore, by the structure theorem, the tropical hyposurface is an eight-dimensional polyhedral complex in R9. Okay? It's not so easy to draw an eight-dimensional space shape in nine-dimensional space, but we've done it, right? And the reason we can do that is because there's a very large torus action. So it turns out that this equation, the determinant, is very, very, very homogeneous. There are five degrees of freedom in scaling this. You can scale the rows separately. You can scale the columns separately. This separate scaling of row and columns translates into an additive action. So this thing, this variety, will look like this. It will look like a book. It will look like an arrangement like this of, it's a polyhedral complex that's a fan. It has a five-dimensional space down here, and it has three-dimensional leaves going off. So modulo this five-dimensional space will only have a three-dimensional polyhedral fan. A finite union, in fact, the union of 15, 15 three-dimensional cones emanating from the origin, any two of which intersect in a common face of each. But a three-dimensional fan is the same thing as a two-dimensional polyhedral complex. You see the complex in the handout. We'll discuss it at 3 o'clock. Thanks for your attention.